Hi, Martina. Um, we, I was letting people into another room. We're a little backed up right now. I'm looking at your guest list and I see a lot of people there, but I'm not sure who the particular ones that are presenting are. So um, I will need you to assign co-hosting abilities to them. And then, um, and then we can let them into the room. Do you know how to assign a co-host or do you want me to walk you through it? Hi everyone, um, I just admitted everyone into the main room here to come have a conversation. We've been having some technical difficulties this morning. Um, I have seen people pop in. There is a waiting room. So um, if you are presenting, someone will need to be responsible for letting those people in, but you'll receive a notification that says there is someone in the waiting room. Um, if you can please raise your hand if you're presenting, I can assign you as a co-host. All six of us, Alexandra. Okay. Um, where... I'm actually presenting in another room, <laughs> so I'm <laughs> a little late. Um, let's see. Um, Martina, let's see. Terry. Okay. So um, you should all be able to see the um, people come into the room. Uh, if you're a co-host. So I'm just going to do that here. And um, you are welcome to start whenever you'd like, or if you want to wait a few minutes, that's also an option um, for you. I am going to make Martina the host so that ah. you can hold the breakout rooms. Uh, Dana, I see you have your hand raised. Okay. I've never been a co-host, <clears throat> so. You have a lot of responsibilities. No, I'm kidding. Well, no, I see one person to admit. And is that? Yeah, you can admit them now. Um, I have to pop into one more room to make sure everyone is where they need to go, but I will check back in with you guys later. Um, I also need to be a co host. Okay, uh, Martina, you'll need to make her a co host now that I've given you hosting abilities. And so, in order to do that, you will click the participants button at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And that should pull up a panel. And then in the panel, you'll hover over uh, the name and then you'll see a button that says more. And Ooh. then you click the more button and then okay. assign co-host. <laughs> I'm completely in the weeds. Help me out here. Okay. Margaret. So <laughs> I just admitted the, uh, the other person who was waiting in the waiting room okay. and I've begun to share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Um, I see Mitch is also a co-host. Thanks for joining, Mitch. <laughs> He's not on our panel, but <laughs> Margaret, I, I know. I was just adding people. Um, Martina, if you want to go down to where it says participants, do you see the button that has like two figures? Um, it has two figures. And I, I don't. I just see us. I don't see the shared screen. Okay, I see the participants. Um, you can, all oh, the more, here we go, sorry. Um, and what am I choosing under more? The make co-host. Um, I'm not getting that. It's okay if you're not co-host. It just gives you the ability to admit people to the waiting room. So not everyone needs to be a co-host in order to participate. Yeah, I'm only getting three choices. Uh, none of them are under more. Alexander, would it be possible to make Margaret the host? 
Um, I've already transferred the okay. hosting. So then that would be something that Martina would need to do. Okay. All right. I think we'll manage. Okay. Thank you. Margaret's co-host. Dana. Make co-host. Got it. Thanks. Small minor miracle. <laughs> you really don't want me running your technology. <laughs> I believe that everyone who is in the waiting room is admitted. Do we want to get started or do you want to wait a couple of minutes? Uh, let's say let's give it till eight. Let's give it two more minutes. Okay. We'll start at whatever your time is, 10 after. Okay. And Margaret, it's okay if I get rid of this window of participants, et cetera? I think it will only affect what you see, I believe. Okay. And are we all gonna be on mute if we're not presenting? Yes. Yes, you can all mute and unmute yourselves. Okay. Are we all gonna stay on camera? That depends on how each individual has their setup. So um, you can do the hide video panel if you would like to not see the video panels. And where is that control, Margaret? For me, it's under something called more. Um, uh -huh next to remote control, I can drop that down and I can hide video panel. I only see breakout rooms under more. Okay. It may only be whose screen sharing can do that. Okay, yeah. that's fine, thank you. Sure. Should we make Mitch um, uh, not a co-host? <laughs> I don't know that it matters. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to admit Tamiko Jones is here. Yay, Tamiko. Hey, Tamiko. <laughs> uh, for those of you just joining, we're going to get started in just a couple minutes. There was some technical difficulties, and we're just getting everything in order now. I have 10 after. Does the group right. want to get started? Sure. Okay. Thanks, Margaret. Sure. If there's any technical issues, let me know and I can try to solve them from my end. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Margaret Lejeune. And I'm just reorganizing a few things on my end. <laughs> thank you for joining us today for this session. And thank you to the organizers for inviting us to share our collective during this important event. During spring of 2020, the Environmental Photography with Collective was born out of a desire to create a more inclusive space in the historically androcentric fields of landscape and environmental photography. As artists with a long history as educators, our members have diverse yet overlapping interests that include environmental science, land use, biology, geology, cultural studies, and social justice. The breadth of our interests helps to build connective tissue between our members, cultural producers, community leaders, scientific researchers, creating new production methods and way to disseminate our work. Our ex expeditionary practices in the US and abroad reflects complex complex, important issues of climate change, habitat and species loss, social, political, and geographic boundaries, and alarming shifts to the Earth's major systems. Rather than present our accomplishments individually, we have chosen to gather and unify our professional credentials holistically. Our creative research practices, teaching, curation, writing, and social activist works have been honored by many prestigious awards fellowships, and recognitions. Our prints, books, videos, and writing are part of important private and public collections. 
As our title, Resonant Ecology, suggests, we are interested in ways to expand our networks and build bonds with the local communities. To this end, our members have participated in artist residencies around the world in which we have done field work, collaborated with scientists, mined archives, and created new partnerships in the art world and beyond. Our works have been exhibited internationally in solo and group exhibitions and published in commercial, independent, and university press publications, as well as in small run artist books. The ecosystem of the Environmental Photography Collective is both a model and a metaphor that highlights our interconnections. To nurture one another is to thrive. By elevating our responsibilities and stewardship to each other, we forge our mutually shared concerns for the earth and the ways in which we communicate these ideas through visual culture. The format of our presentation will be a round robin interview today. We ask that you please use the chat button at the bottom of the screen to pose questions, which we will field at the end of our discussion. I'd like to begin the conversation by asking Martina Schienel to share some thoughts on what climate change looks like. Thanks, Margaret. The collective raises questions around how climate change impacts people and ecosystems as naturally occurring forces become systemically altered in a rapidly warming climate. Data visualization models make visible areas of concern in the US, here indicated in red, locations that have already reached a two degrees Celsius rise. Scientists have sounded the alarm for decades that rising temperatures will lead to catastrophic effects globally and have revised the threshold to 1.5 Celsius based on these accelerating impacts. Do you remember when localized storms, fires, and floods started to feel more apocalyptic, when forces of nature no longer felt natural? Utilizing the photographic powers of observation as profound sources of knowledge, the collective's amassed body of creative work is a testament to a lifetime of paying close attention to the subtleties of the cyclical, cyclical nature around us. Fire plays a critical role in the natural cycle of renewal and decades of fire suppression and human encroachment have negatively impacted forest ecosystems. Witness the 2020 wildfires driven by mega droughts in the West, record-breaking sustained high temperatures, high winds, and plenty of fuel. They are now bigger, stronger, faster, with an extended fire season and tens of millions of dollars spent trying to contain each of these fires. After watching the Bighorn Fire burn for seven weeks in the Santa Catalina Mountains in Tucson, across the state line in Oregon, just as the wildfires were breaking out, the central high desert um, had the worst air quality in the world during my time there, in part due to the accumulation of smoke from hundreds of fires that were also burning across California. Visibility dropped from 10 miles to hundreds of yards. The reduction in CO2 levels tracked in the early stages of the pandemic were completely wiped out by the massive wildfires that burned across the West. Over the past decade, my work has been grounded in the landscape, including volcanic sites in the Japanese archipelago. A shift in focus came during a year long research leave based in Fujisawa that allowed time and space for extended observation, exploring an infrastructure built to withstand repeated earthquakes and typhoons. This view through a broken exterior, exterior panel was made from the landing of my apartment in the aftermath of the storm. Here we see landscape as an accumulation of systems carefully engineered to restrain, redirect, and ultimately control. I witnessed the accelerating pace and power of these storms, once again locked down in the same neighborhood during super typhoon Hagibis in October of 2019. The region was impacted by high winds and up to 36 inches of rain as the storm stalled and slowed over land, an effect exacerbated by a warming climate creating a multi-billion dollar disaster. Collective members have overlapping research interests. Here, Marion Bellinger's Rift Fault features a twin narrative that draws our attention to tectonic processes and long time scales, exploring both the seen and unseen. On the left is the fault, the San Andreas Fault in California, 
And on the right is Rift, where the North American and Eurasian plates meet in Iceland. Marion writes, these dichotomies create a visual tension that questions the uneasy relationship between geologic force and the limits of human intervention. Her image pairings are both subtle and intriguing, reinforcing their conceptual underpinnings. On the left, you see crumpled plastics in the searing light of the California desert, and on the right, <clears throat> melting ice in Iceland, an apt metaphor for our current predicament as cause and effect remnants of human impacts of convenience and rampant overconsumption. The landscapes in Japan is a carefully and obviously shaped at all scales an interest that both Dana, Fritz and I share. She writes, this practice of designing, domesticating and improving upon nature reveals simultaneously our distance from and longing for the natural depending on the cultural lens from which it is viewed. Moving from an early focus within Japanese gardens on the left, literally bending nature to our will, to the miniaturized scale of bonsai in an inventive reconfiguring of nature in the series views removed on the right. To her current project, Field Guide to a Hybrid Landscape, I'd like to invite Dana to speak more directly on how the radical reshaping of the land leads to the river of consequences. Thanks, Martina. <clears throat> Many of our projects reveal consequences of ideas that become actions. Writers from Rachel Carson to Elizabeth Colbert have pointed out the folly of our attempts to control nature. This providential ideology separating humans from nature literally shaped our nation as it became federal policy. In Field Guide to a Hybrid Landscape, I make visible the human and non-human forces that shaped Nebraska National Forest at Halsey, the largest hand-planted forest in the Western Hemisphere. Planting trees here was an ambitious plan to make the grassland more productive and to change the semi-arid local climate. The seemingly unlimited source of water in the Ogallala Aquifer made it possible to plant a forest on the dry prairie Willa Cather called the Sea of Grass. The U.S. Department of Agriculture took an industrial farming approach, planting trees in dense rows. This created a fire hazard made worse by the prohibition of traditional maintenance burning that protects against catastrophic megafires. The first federal nursery was established to grow trees for this effort. Today it produces millions of seedlings annually, but none for the adjacent forest. In what seems like an ironic inversion, the nursery now grows replacement trees for burned and beetle damaged national forests in the Rocky Mountains on a mission to mitigate and repair effects of large scale climate change. Photographers have long endeavored to make visible the complexities of our environment and Dorothea Lang's work provides an opportunity to examine the consequences of ideas when put into action through law. The Dust Bowl was a human caused environmental disaster, a confluence of bad weather, bad practices and bad policy. Despite the resulting emergence of watershed scale federal planning, most industrial farms today still use chemical fertilizers that flow downstream through the Mississippi River Basin into the Gulf of Mexico and they lose twice as much topsoil to erosion per year as farmers did in the Dust Bowl. The Gulf's dead zone, shown in red on the map, is a result. Margaret Lejeune focuses on the consequences in her series, Growing Light, a study in watershed thinking. To make these images, Margaret uses bioluminescent organisms as the light source for photograms. The work connects the USGS hydromaps of the largest agricultural watersheds in the US to the dinoflagellates that caused the harmful algal blooms known as red tides, stimulated by terrestrial runoff. These events produce powerful toxins that sicken marine species and endanger human health. The Mississippi is one of the most heavily <clears throat> engineered rivers in the United States. Over time, the character of the old river's meanders, floodplains and wetlands have been modified for millions of acres of agriculture and urbanization, causing a land loss crisis that leaves the area ever more vulnerable to hurricanes and floods. 
and video works from Another Storm is Coming. Judy Natal beautifully and sorrowfully weaves together stories and songs of Gulf Coast residents recounting hurricane experiences, knowing they are not likely to be the last. Judy writes, the Gulf Coast between New Orleans and Houston literally seems to float as a kind of terra infirma that is liquid and fluidly unstable. A watery mirage drawn by human intervention and land use that persists long after the storm. The Gulf of Mexico connects Nebraska's Sea of Grass in the Mississippi River watershed to the River of Grass, the Florida Everglades, a globally unique and threatened ecosystem. Before drainage projects to create drier land for agriculture and urban expansion, freshwater flowed seasonally in a wide, shallow river through miles of wetlands. The interruption of natural sources of fresh water nearly killed the Everglades in Florida Bay. Marion Bellinger's complex exploration of this site includes healthy mangroves that provide habitat for fish and birds, as well as protection from hurricanes. But she also includes destroyed swampland that reminds us of the consequences of our actions. Terry Tempest Williams wrote, the choices and the decisions we make in terms of how we use the land ultimately affect our very DNA. Environmental issues are life issues. In this way, we are all downstream. Watershed scale thinking supersedes arbitrary political borders that divide people and ecosystems, fragmenting place. I'd like to ask Terry Warpinski to share some ideas about understanding place through fieldwork. Thank you, Dana. Among the many dimensions our collective's individual research and creative practices share is a reliance on fieldwork, where the theoretical or hypothetical meets the imaginary powers of the artist, provoked through the ground truthing of direct observation. In 2000, 2001, I was working on a project in Israel looking at the spiritual geography shared by Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Coinciding with the outbreak of the Second Intifada, I was hindered by the tightly constrained access and the intense unrest of that time. My work reflected the current moment more than it adhered to the thesis of my proposal. Instead, it became unsettled land, probing the shifting occupation and struggle between Israel and the Palestinians. The photographs made reveal something of the nature of contested territory. Gretel Ehrlich writes, quote, I think of the landscape not as a fixed place, but as a path that is unwinding before my eyes, under my feet, end quote. In that time of upheaval, I profoundly witnessed that, indeed, the ground on which we stand is the accumulation of nature, culture, history, and ideology. The course of my work had to follow the course of my direct observation rather than cling to the tenets of my proposed project. Over the next two decades, I returned numerous times and for extended periods to these and other contested borderlands to witness the ongoing dialectic between place and change, each time growing my bonds to and knowledge of the people and the place. The collective shares this pattern of connection and deepening intimacy with our subjects. Place is often only the starting point, the beginning of the journey. Over time, fully immersed in our subject, our once strongly held notions, our preconceptions are disassembled and reconstituted, leading to creative insights otherwise impossible to imagine. In evidence of the dart, Margaret Lejeune's gathering of both plant matter and refuse from along the Dart River invites our reconsideration of the role of collecting specimens in the creation of knowledge and the indexicality of the photographic object. In this past year of isolating at home, I found my perspective shifting towards considering my own home ground as the locus of my practice, a radical departure from the majority of my work over the past 30 years. As with Dana's work in the Nebraska National Forest, others in the collective have also found rich conceptual material 
and engage in extensive field work in locations they now or once called home. Such is the case in Marian Bellinger's commissioned work, River. Here, Marian reminisces on her childhood experiences of the Naugatuck River, recounts its near death, and gently emanates hopefulness for the rebirth of this Connecticut waterway. This project, like so many in the collective, goes far beyond a vignette. It is a multi-layered view, extending the sense of presence beyond the individual frame. With the pandemic came an abrupt halt to my ongoing project work in almost all scheduled exhibitions. As with so many of us in the quiet isolation of my home, I reflected on many things I took previously for granted, such as the more personal aspects of climate change and the carbon footprint I generated from traveling. Land Trust is a work in progress begun in 2020. On the surface, it speaks to regenerative land practices. Since European settlement occurred in this region, Door County has suffered from the abuse of overuse. It was at risk of being loved to death. First a highly sought after locale for commercial fishing and shipbuilding, then agriculture, ultimately in the last century, it's risk being fully capitalized by tourism. Established in 1986, the Door County Land Trust preserves lands that contribute significantly to the ecological integrity of the area. Thus far, they have worked to protect more than 8,500 acres of fields, forests, farmlands, orchards, wetlands, and shoreline. My attachments to this particular place run deep. It is where my life began. Below the surface, the work examines the palimpsest of land use. As work on land trust continues, it will integrate historic material, photographs, texts, and maps from local archives, along with my photographs and drawings, much like occurs in the series Field Studies. This inclination to draw from, and in many cases directly include historic materials in our work, is a common ground shared by the collective. It can reveal that which is hidden from our contemporary vantage point. It may evidence change, it can provoke, and it can inspire. Marian Bellinger has found much inspiration in the archive. I'd like to ask Marian to share some of her experiences with you. Thank you so much, Terry. I've been working on a permanent installation at the Connecticut Agricultural Experimental Station in New Haven, Connecticut, along with my collaborator, Martha Lewis. Our project, Plants and Insects, Excavating the Archive, draws upon the vast library holdings that include photographs, books, documents, and specimens. Concurrently, I've been photographing at climate research facilities such as the Harvard Forest, NOAA, and others. Last March, when everything shut down, I began to combine the recontextualized archive photos with those I had made in the forest and at the research sites. I loved the visuality of the pairings, my explorations within the archive, and the fact that I was able to find a new and exciting way to make land-based images for my home. The oddness of the photographic pairs seemed to parallel the strangeness of the current moment. The global pandemic and our current climate crisis places us in an urgent and historic place. Art can speak to this. My process of mining the archive motivated me to explore how others in the collective use historic documents in their practice. I chose to reference some of the smaller series, those that, that are nestled within a larger whole. I was drawn to how the quiet whisper of time insisted that it be heard. Dana Fritz has made a small edition handmade artist book titled Pocket Field Guide to a Hybrid Landscape, measuring at only four by five inches when closed. Dana used a topographical map of the Nebraska National Forest for the inside cover pages, which metaphorically encloses the book within the forest. In this little book, I was interested in the layering of images and of time. Archive photographs printed on semi-translucent pages are overlaid upon one side of the double page spreads. Here we see workers plowing the grasslands in preparation to plant trees. When the historic photograph is opened, two images of the invasive and destructive Easter, Eastern red cedar fill the space. 
I appreciate how the physical gesture of opening the page gives the viewer a sense of time and consequence. A shaded fabric structure cleared of growth covers a photograph of tightly planted spruce seedlings. The linear pattern of shade and light surround a man and a shovel, perhaps signifying the boundary between the undoing of the natural ecosystem that was once there and the future human reshaping of the landscape to come. Pictured on the right is a plastic covered greenhouse, the first federal nursery. Dana refers to Nebraska as a hybrid landscape. I wonder, are there any authentic wild landscapes left anywhere? Judy Natal saw this historic photograph of the walking knitter at the Faroe Islands National History Museum. Made by a Danish photographer in the early 1900s, we see her as she walks, knits, and balances milk bins. Her gaze meets ours. She is efficient, strong, and creative. Judy later made this beautiful portrait of a modern day walking knitter where she leads walking and knitting tours through the lava fields, glaciers, and highlands of Iceland. Inspired by a Faroese woman who knitted traditional Faroese proverbs, Judy's weather proverb panels are drawn from local landscape and knowledge from the three islands where she has been working, the Faroes, Hawaii, and Iceland. The panels are approximately 30 by 40 inches and hand knitted from naturally dyed wool in Nova Scotia. Judy's practice is interdisciplinary and deeply research-based. She expands her creative practice outward from the still two-dimensional surface of the photograph to tactile knitted panels and back to time-based moving image videos. In Judy's Walking Knitter, we see a symbolic self-portrait as she weaves together mediums, locations, and different narratives into a warming of climate catastrophe and a celebration of craft and traditional knowledge. Margaret Lejeune is an artist who draws heavily from science and in her capacity as a sailor, she has experienced firsthand the capricious nature of the sea. Just below the surface is a series of large photographic collages inspired by sailing. Using abstraction and geometric forms, she investigates both the power of nature and the human desire to control it. The images reflect a novice sailor's struggle with instability and uneasiness in the water, while also highlighting, highlighting the expressive beauty and power of the seascape and of creativity itself. Margaret will now speak on art inspired by science. Thank you, Marian. I've spent the last seven years splitting my time between the land and sea. During this time, I have sailed mainly in the Northern Atlantic along the US East Coast, the Bahamas, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Living on the water has allowed me a privileged relationship with the ocean, weather, and marine creatures. During my time on the water, I developed a curiosity about bioluminescent organisms and their role as indicator species to the health of the oceans and their connections to climate change. This curiosity initially sparked the series Growing Light, which Dana mentioned earlier in our conversation. In the process of making this work, I developed skills to grow and culture marine bioluminescent organisms in my studio. I use these organisms to make commentary on the ways in which the Earth systems are being radically altered through climate change, including the surge in harmful algal blooms and the dramatic uptick in hurricanes and other severe weather events due to warming ocean temperatures. In my current series, Illuminating the Sixth Extinction, I examine the current mass extinction event through collaborative image making with non-human species, relying again on the metaphor of luminescent and bioluminescent properties. This project developed while I worked alongside herptologist, entomologist, and mammalian biologist at the University of Notre Dame Environmental Research Center. This image, Lampyridae composition number two, was created by temporarily containing Lampyridae beetles, also known as fireflies, in a light-proof box. During this short containment, I'm able to achieve their uh, archive, their ritual light performance on sheets of four by five color film. As they walk and fly inside the box, 
they blink species-specific patterns in search of mates. The light-sensitive photographic material documents the passage of time, as well as the rich color of the luminescence without disturbing the natural life cycle of the organism. These images reveal a repetition of legs, blinking light patterns, and the vertical motion of the bugs shown in the various sizes of the circular light spots. Hmm. Sorry, we're having a little technical issue here. Firefly sightings have dropped precipitously over the last decade, both in terms of location and individual numbers. Oops, sorry, problem again. <laughs> okay, firefly sightings have dropped precipitously over the last decade, both in terms of location and individual numbers. In this regard, they've become bioluminescent indicator species of the Anthropocene. The noticeable absence of these glowing beacons from roadside hedgerows and prairie fields is a stark reminder of the unseen number of species lost due to pesticide use, habitat loss, light pollution, urbanization, industrialization, and agricultural intensification. Several members of the collective also engage with the scientific community as part of their creative process. Our curiosity and research have opened opportunities for us to work at field stations, research forests, and laboratories across the country and around the globe. For example, Judy Natal's project Future Perfect includes uh, from her time as an artist residence at uh, Biosphere 2. These works ask us to examine our hopes and expectations for an unknowable future. Dana Fritz's residency at the Cedar Point Biological Station allowed her time to more deeply research the Nebraska Sandhills through the library collection and herbarium. Marian Bellinger's current collaborative project with Martha Lewis uses images from the archives to activate the space at the Connecticut Agricultural Experimental Station in New Haven. And Terry Warpinski's Empties Nests, created in collaboration with the University of Wisconsin Natural History Museum, reframes the idea of the cabinet of curiosity through an installation and accompanying diagram, allowing space for the overlapping conversations between the scientific, social, and personal. In this tableau of photographic, drawn, and collected objects, the viewer is asked to unravel the complex narrative that both explores the human condition and our planetary reality. As demonstrated by these examples, artists and their work have the ability to move fluidly, to cross boundaries, and enliven conversations in a wider range of public and private spheres. The collective has created several public engagement projects that promote the understanding of science, democratization of knowledge, and promote curiosity about the ways in which the local can affect the global in terms of climate crisis issues. Community engagement is a part of our individual and collective creative practices. Our diverse projects on sustainability, futurism, water pollution, ocean plastics, and more have engaged wide audiences, including K through 12 children, university students, scientific communities, water keepers, and artist colonies. Each endeavor helps to build and strengthen our network of local and global activists. In Judy Natal's video work, Breathed on the Waters, we are confronted with a myriad of songs and chants across faith, socioeconomic lines, and racial identities. These pleas for safety and compassion from the next storm call attention to faith and prayer as ways of knowing and understanding the climate crisis. Though often discounted as gendered and feminine, emotional responses are important ways of knowing and reacting to the world. This work affords me this perfect space in which to ask Judy to discuss the personal and emotional dimensions of climate chaos. Thank you, Margaret. Um, thinking and feeling are often cast as polar opposites. Though for me, they are simply different ways of knowing. Emotions are intellects equal. Though my art has always posed far more questions than answers, for the past three years, I've been working on a hybrid work called The Weather Diaries, weaving together three volcanic island sites of Iceland, the Faroe Islands, and Hawaii through interviews, research, photography, music, craft, and video. It is the most challenging project I've ever done. It is also the most personal and emotional. It demands of me a willingness to be vulnerable, transparent, and profoundly honest with myself. 
The work also demands that I step away from long established formal habits that created distance between me, the subject and the viewer, instilling a curtain of photographic neutrality. It took me a year to reinvent new pictorial strategies that would instead foster a sense of intimacy, blurring boundaries between portrait landscape and still life, welcoming everyone as participants rather than observers. This shift dictated that I shed my artistic ego, relinquish a certain amount of control and identifiable style, so important to art as commodity, and step out of my own way and let the photographic subject speak for themselves rather than amplify my own voice. There is an emotional nakedness, a directness in the images. My goal is to seek out honor and elevate people who have acute sustainable relationships with the natural world. And I am molecularly altered by these experiences. Didacticism once meant to teach has become a dirty word. After years of fearing this label, I now embrace it, driven by the urgency, obligation, and sense of responsibility to contemplate the moral and ethical issues of the climate crisis in my work. I've discovered there is even a new word for this, ecological didacticism. I can no longer be neutral. We are killing the earth and all of its living systems. We are killing ourselves. We have and continue to shun our responsibilities of stewardship with little care or concern for the future. Visual symbols of human folly are everywhere. Without fresh water, clean air, and agricultural equity, social injustices prevail and humans die. Emotions, unfettered and raw, make people uncomfortable. But isn't that what we should be feeling now? Well, grief often takes the form of a lament, a passionate expression of sorrow, something that is regretted or about someone or something that has been lost. Laments are often musical in nature, reaching the deepest part of our emotional responses. Laments are usually accompanied by wailing, moaning, singing, or crying. In Margaret Lejeune's work, Shifting Halo, she sees how climate change and logging are impacting the forest, disrupting the habitat of the, the residual boreal chickadee and indicator species. Bird song bird call song waves punction her, punctuate her photographs, reminding us of their disappearing presence, their song hanging in the air as auditory ghosts. The word sustainable has many meanings. Here, however, I use the word sustainable to think about how we can sustain our emotional and personal involvement around climate issues, despite our discomfort or grief, or perhaps even fueled by this. The philosopher Michel Foucault states, I dream of a new age of curiosity where we have the technical means for it, the desire, the things to be known are infinite. People exist to do this, why do we suffer? Curiosity evoked for Foucault a diminishment of traditional hierarchies, as well as care and concern for what exists and what could exist, a readiness to find strange and singular in what surrounds us. Our experiences of the world come through all of our senses, not just vision. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it is how the simple act of touch connects us in inexplicable ways and shatters our human exceptionalism. Emotions engage all five senses and sometimes a sixth sense and are transformative. In Marion Bellinger's Feeling Moss, she explores the fullness of the senses during walks with her blind two-year-old granddaughter and through her expands and deepens her own relationship with nature. Our imaginations must go beyond walls and borders. Climate chaos cannot be contained by physical barriers, but moves around the globe unfettered, whether we like it or not. The only things that should be corralled is our grief, fear, anger, and finger pointing. We have at our fingertips sustainable practices. Why are we not implementing this knowledge on a grand scale? Attuning our senses, elevating and trusting our imaginations, acknowledging our grief, fear, and anxiety. We are not separate from the web of life. We are all equally enmeshed in it. This interconnectedness is our collective power and gives me courage to call for and work toward radical social change.
Our collective, rather than emphasizing any one work or artist, provides opportunities to open up our perspectives, to consider other points of view and diverse knowledge forms between our diverse individual approaches. While we often photograph the land, these works move beyond the modernist notion of landscape photography and aesthetics to consider the ecologic, ecology of place and our interconnectedness both to the life systems of the planet, to ourselves and our communities. Like seeds in a pod that get scattered by the winds and the birds across the ocean and sky, our collective disseminates ideas, art, and engagement. Thank you, and I'd like to open up the discussion uh, for Q&A. Margaret? Hello, if anyone has questions, I think we're a small group, so you could unmute yourself and we could answer questions rather than type them in the chat box. <laughs> Hello out there. <laughs> Is that you, Tamiko? Um, good morning. It is. Good morning. And I have on my video because I'm still in my pajamas. <laughs> well, it's early here in Arizona. <laughs> it is. Um, I just really want to thank you for this presentation. Actually, I love the way that um, you you each spoke about each other's work collectively. I'm just sort of processing that. I mean, I work a lot in the landscape too, so this has been really um, an inspiration. And so I'm not sure if I have a direct question, but I was just now reflecting um, on the role of the of research, you know, the kind of like scientific engagement with um, the kind of anecdotal or you didn't use the word anecdotal, but I use it for myself a lot, but the kind of the personal that Judy talked about in the last and maybe that could be a nice question for the panel because I think as a from my own experience, sometimes I really struggle with the kind of storytelling that I love to share with the sort of factual information that comes along with some of the right, the, the data that we have to collect in order to start the work, but then as we begin making the work, it becomes a, a personal um, experience. So if anyone wants to reflect on, on that process for themselves um, or finding that balance. I well, I guess I'd like to start, um, you know, storytelling, you know, as, as we know, there are many, many forms of storytelling. And the way I think about storytelling is oral histories, which is a much more academic term, um, but it allows uh, the voice of the person uh, uh, making the work, again, as I mentioned, to step aside and let the subject speak for themselves in sharing what we might call, when you call something an anecdote, it's a way of, I think, diminishing uh, the power of it. It makes it feel like it's not factual. And in fact, um, that kind of story perhaps has even more power in addressing um, our climate issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to add to that, that um, I've been thinking a lot about storytelling recently and also sort of in collaboration with that word, the idea of agency. And as I'm working with more and more non-human species in my work, I'm trying to think about ways that I can enable um, right, these non-human species to tell their own stories. And through this project of the, you know, illuminating the sixth extinction, I'm literally working with the physicality of these mm -hmm. organisms to, to tell a narrative, to tell their story. And so it's a, a very different way of thinking, you know, as someone who's worked with oral histories like Judy has or archives, et cetera, it's just such a, a new and exciting venture for me in my work. I think, um, you know, some of the most exciting um, art coming um, out these days is really a hybrid between the factual and the imaginative. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I'm thinking of movies, you know, there's like Minari, um, um, even Nomadland, you know, which is kind of a hybrid. Um, and you know, I, I find myself working more and more in that um, vein during, especially during this past year. Um, and I have actually found it to be um, very um, exciting 
you know, to kind of um, give myself permission to kind of color outside the lines a little bit, so to speak. So, I guess I'm also thinking that the um, the idea of of trying to tell a story. Um, a lot of times, you know, reality is stranger than fiction. And, right. you know, some of, sometimes I, I, the things I'm hearing, I, I couldn't have even imagined. And, yeah. um, and yet they're very real and uh, they're kind of, uh, they need to be heard because it may not be someone's experience to, uh, ex to uh, know what a volcano feels like as it erupts or, you know, all of Icelanders are right now and the world are enthralled by this volcano, this slow moving volcanic eruption. So I've always felt, although I do um, really appreciate uh, what one might call creative nonfiction, which means that you might take a few liberties with enhancing the story and you, which I think is kind of, uh, would not necessarily be done in an oral history and dealing with someone's own words. Um, but life is definitely stranger than fiction. I guess my impulse has always been that there is no experience of geography that is without meaning. And it's so easy to forget that, especially um, with the impulse to aestheticize a uh, place or experience of it, um, rather than to sort of peel away and really read and understand and, and embrace what's there. And that I feel has been my biggest challenge over the last decades is to get to that place where it's more stripped bare in dealing with the, the grit of reality in place rather than my desire for beauty. Any other questions, Scott? Have you unmuted? <clears throat> I can call on you. <laughs> Hello, don't put me on the spot. Hey. <laughs> Hi, Scott. Um, well, I'm I'm curious. Sort of, this is sort of like maybe meta, but I'm I'm, I'm curious about your uh, the actual collaboration uh, that you all have put together here and how that's um, in some some ways I think with the sheltering in place in the pandemic. And I'm, I'm wondering as things be, hopefully begin to loosen a bit and travel or being able to get around, if you consider actually getting together, you know, physically and how that might uh, either advance or change your thinking about working with each other. What a joy it would be to <laughs> sit together and share a bottle of wine and um, lay prints out and share artist books. I mean, it's unfathomable. I get goosebumps just thinking about the possibility of our collective shifting to an in-person collective. I think that the collective formed because, because of the pandemic and we, we were looking for ways to make connections and Zoom and all of these other video conferencing techniques allowed us, it sort of gave us a permission that we didn't have before, you know, that we maybe didn't feel like we could reach out in these sort of ways. Um, but once Zoom became this sort of norm, it just made sense to reach out to these women who have admired and respected and, you know, really wanted to be able to share work with. And it, so it just sort of, took off and we've been meeting very regularly with the hopes I think of maybe a retreat someday or a residency where we could work together and wondering what it would look like if we shifted to actually collaborative work you know could we work on a publication or something like that together so all of these things are sort of up in the air and being discussed with a, a sort of hope for what post-pandemic life might look like. Yeah, but I want to say that um, I think we knew that this could be possible because of pre-pandemic um, conference meetings, right? So we knew each other through SPE and other kind of photo related things. And that's how we knew who to ask to be in the, in the collective. And so I'm really curious about what will 
what will we continue that we started during the pandemic and how will everything change? Like we already know that our regular conferences are not going to be the same mm -hmm. or not even going to exist this year and maybe next year. So that leaves us opportunities to try to get together in a different way, right? Because we can't rely on that anymore. But I'm also curious, I don't know if anyone else wants to address Scott's question or a question that I had, which was really about the things that changed for us during the pandemic and how we might, if we might continue any of those. I mean, so much has changed, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of a big question. Um, I guess I, I meant in our practices or- Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I say absolutely. I mean, I kind of really fully embrace a lot of the, the changes. And I think we've all had to rethink how we make work and, um, you know, our, our travel footprint. I think Martina, you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and we're looking, um, I mean, I think our everyday life has become a little more um, a part of our subject matter, which is pretty interesting um, during this time. So, home, yeah, home yeah. hasn't been a subject, you know, for a lot of us and, you know, looking uh, to the local, I think is a very different thing for me. Um, my work has always been about being away. That's mm -hmm. sort of, especially in islands, you know, 5,000 miles away, that, that sort of dual um, um, duality between wanting to be really out there and then once you get there, you're so isolated and there's this sort of twin draw back to home. And so that's always been really captivating for me over the last decade or so is that, that, that push pull um, between uh, escape, isolation, and then wanting to be back home. You know, that all of those things sort of in play. Yeah, and I think it's worth mentioning that the climate crisis is, really have has been building momentum you know uh, art, artistic responses political responses um thanks to joe biden grassroots uh organizations and so i feel like it's not just uh the the collective has uh you know through our work has taken on a a mission of addressing environmental issues and um my hope is, is, is that we continue to work toward um, imaginatively addressing these issues and making a contribution wherever we can um, because it's not gonna go away anytime soon. And so there's our own personal growth, but then there's also the larger umbrella of artists' responsibilities to address this issue. and in the fullness and uh, and volume that it deserves. You know, well, I, I wanted to mention to, oh, I'm sorry, Scott, go yeah, ahead. No, I was just gonna say, so there's, there's strength in numbers, that's for sure. And, <laughs> uh, no, even just because it's the panel, I think it's, it's really just bringing you together and you know, blending your, your uh, practices and concerns was really, really good to see. Well, thank you for attending. I think we're kind of a hometown crowd at this point. <laughs> I think it's really too beautiful outside. <laughs> at yeah. least it's beautiful yeah. here. I can't yeah, wait I, know. To know. I, I think on a Saturday, you know, at the, you know, beginning of spring when the flowers are coming out and it, there's a blue sky and it's going to rain, at least here in Connecticut tomorrow. Um, yeah. It's a hard, it's a hard competition. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm just heading out to a friend's uh, biodiversity farm to go ramp uh, hunting out in there. Oh, how exciting! The, wow. the Genesee River. <laughs> yeah, that's well, great. great. Say hi to Judith and James for me. Oh, I sure will. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess it's 
10 it's probably two. time for us to close, I think. I because think so. Yeah. We're at the hour. So it is. And most people will be viewing this as a taped archive um, presentation since the conference has four tracks, five tracks yes. overlapping. Mm -hmm. so. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Julia, for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.